<laughs> oh, you're killing me. Is it real short now? Is it shorter? Yes. No. <laughs> I didn't notice. It, it looks great. I forgive you. All right, well, welcome everyone. I see the waiting room is starting to empty, which means you are all on your way here to our virtual happy hour with Natalie Wexler. As you can see, um, as it says on the screen, the very least welcoming virtual greeting I could possibly give is please on mic. Uh, but it is not, it, it just, um, it's more so that we don't hear what you're ordering ordering for dinner when your husband orders the pizza or when it's uh -huh. time to go to bed. It's just the background noise. It doesn't mean we don't want to hear from you. Um, so we do appreciate that. And I am old. I was gonna say old school, but I might as well just go with old. So if you wouldn't mind leaving your camera on so that we can see you as well. So it feels more interactive. Um, today's episode, <laughs> like really floored me with the dedication of teachers, which is something that continues to never surprise, but always um, astound me. And their dedication today to making sure they get it right um, really struck with me. And thank you to finding your way somewhere on a Thursday night during your summer. I do appreciate that. Uh, however, no one's here to hear me speak. We are here for the wonderful Natalie Wexler, who has done so much to move the needle to getting things right. Um, Natalie, if you don't mind, I'm, I'm, I'm going to read your bio or are you sick of hearing it? That's up to you. Okay, there's just so much yeah. in there. I, I can't not. So, and well, I, you can do an edited version, not just go hit every single thing, but go ahead. I don't know that I have an edited version of anything in me. I'm not sure, I'll try. Um, okay. I also feel like probably not much of this is new because you are just, as I said, you are such a, a needle mover and so appreciated by those of us in the community. In any event, Natalie is an, uh, an education writer and the author of The Knowledge Gap, The Hidden Cause of America's Broken Education System and How to Fix It. And uh, it has been transformational for me, by the way, mm -hmm. in my career. And many others. And many, many others. Um, she is the co-author, another book that has transformed my teaching. She's the co-author of The Writing Revolution, a guide to advancing thinking through writing in all subjects and grades, and a senior contributor to Fords.com. Her newsletter, Minding the Gap, on the Substack, which I am going to put in chats, um, is available for free. Uh, as we know, uh, the reason why we are here is that Natalie is also the co-host of a six-part podcast called Reading Comprehension Revisited. It's the, inaugural, it's the inaugural season of the Knowledge Matters podcast, and it's been produced by the Knowledge Matters campaign. Natalie's articles and essays on education and other topics have appeared in the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Atlantic, the Wall Street Journal, the MIT Technology Review. This is bananas. Uh, <laughs> other publications. She's spoken on education before on a wide variety of groups and appeared on a number of TV and radio shows, including uh, the one that I make my coffee to every morning, Morning Joe, and NPR's On Point. She holds a BA from Harvard University, an MA in history from the University of Sussex, and a JD, which I'd love to get more information on that, from the University of Pennsylvania, and she's worked as a reporter, a Supreme Court law clerk, law clerk, a lawyer, and a legal historian. I need to hydrate in the middle of this. <laughs> <It's so much. laughs> um, but I'm guessing she's the author of three novels. She lives in Washington, D.C. And I'm just going to assume that this is the favorite part of your bio, that you live in Washington, D.C. with your husband and you have uh, two adult children. Yeah, so, so unfortunately, unfortunately, don't live with me, but... <laughs> Well, that's the good news. Yeah, unfortunately, unfortunately, unfortunately. <laughs> there is that. <laughs> yeah, those of us with uh, you know adult children. Uh, but Natalie, welcome so much, thank and thank you so much for willing to be willing to share your time and just you know uh, more of your knowledge. My first question for you would be: How exactly did the podcast itself come to be? And while you answer, I'm just going to quickly put your links in the chat. So I am listening. Okay, great. Um, yeah, that's a good question. I mean, I had been, uh, people had been suggesting to me for quite some time that I should do a podcast. 
And I thought, yeah, that's a great idea. I probably reach a lot of people and I love to listen to podcasts, but I have no idea how to do a podcast and I just did not have the bandwidth to figure it out. Mm -hmm. But um, then I was talking with Barbara Davidson, who's the head of the Knowledge Matters campaign. And she said they were thinking about maybe doing some kind of podcast. And I said, well, I was thinking about doing some kind of podcast. And so it just sort of came together actually quite quickly. And um, so th they, you know, had were, they had the expertise. They had they were able to hire a consultant who knew about how to do podcasts and, you know, a recording engineer and um, somebody to compose the music and all of these things I would have had no idea how to do. Um, and so it was a great collaboration and we wanted to get it out. I mean, we just started talking about this. I don't know, Karen might know just a, maybe four or five months ago. And the idea was to get it out this summer when teachers might have time to listen. And I, I have to say, I thought, huh, that's not going to happen. <laughs> it just seemed impossible. But lo and behold, we seem to have done it. So that's the story. Speaking of story, the timing of it to come, you know, for Soul the Story to come first, um, that really sort of poked the bear and, and woke, a lot of, it woke a lot of people up. For this to come on the heels of that, um, it, it's just, the timing is perfect. And it just, it, it brings in the other half of the rope. Yeah, no, I, I mean, Emily and I, you know, we've known each other for a while and uh, we, we've sometimes run into each other at conferences where we're both speaking and we said, yeah, we should go on the road together or whatever, but <laughs> that, it, it didn't quite pan out that way. But I do think, yeah, this is, a, it's, you know, uh, a good compliment to Sold a Story and Emily's other um, audio documentaries, all of which I have listened to, and she's a genius. So if I could have just one, just a fraction of the influence that she's been able to have and the impact she's been able to have, I would be thrilled. I think you're on your way, Natalie. <laughs> Welcome. I, I was just, I was just going to say, you might want to buckle up because pretty sure it's coming. Pretty sure. Uh, so to all of the participants that have so far logged in, feel free to put in the chat where you're from, where you're joining us from. And this is a happy hour. So as uh, feel free to let us know what you're drinking. Tito Tito's could be whatever you <laughs> choose, but we'd like to, oh, really, I love the red wine. <laughs> I have a big thing of water because I'm talking to Natalie Wexler. <laughs> well, I have to keep I, I also have water. <laughs> <laughs> Just in case. You know, one sip, one sip, one sip, one sip. That's very healthy. <laughs> oh, Westchester, hello. This all is so uh, Mr. Connecticut. I'm from Waterbury, Connecticut. Oh, someone's eating a salad. The yum yum. That's what I had. Katie joining from New York City. My girl. Sarasota, that is a beautiful part of the world. Someone's from Oak Park, Illinois. I'm originally from Illinois. Really? Mm hmm. Chicago, born and raised, I might add. And I mean Chicago. Deerfield, Mass. Is that a Yankee Candle? It might be. Anyway, I, I always get like lost in these chats. Um, all right, folks, what are you drinking? Antigo. Oh my gosh. I know John. Hello, John. Nice to see you. Oh, nice you're here. Donna made a friend. That's my old state. John is on a school board, I believe. And he is, he's a mover and shaker. All right. Um, so what I thought is we would start with, um, talking about each episode we'll see how far we get uh we don't want to stay up too late because it's oh i was gonna say it's a school night no it's not we're never ending we're gonna go all night um <laughs> so natalie when i listened um i i tried to look for the, the um the theme to each of the the podcasts to sort of break down the conversation and make it a little bit easier please feel free to tell me if i have not gotten a um the themes as, as you had envisioned them. But when I when I listened to the first, po first podcast, the first theme that kept coming back to me was, you know, the teaching of the skills and the comprehension strategies. Um, can you, when I was listening to it again, sort of, um, we were just 
you know, talking briefly about sold a story, and it was so clear where the three queuing system came from and balanced literacy came from. Can you speak to where did the breakdown of leaving content education come from? And is there a connection between balanced literacy and just getting rid of content rich curriculum? Yeah, that's that's a good question with a complicated answer and I will do my best to make it brief, but I think the deep roots of, of this approach may lie in the idea that it is better for kids to discover or construct their own knowledge than to have somebody standing in the front of the room and just pouring facts into their passive brains, right? Which is not really what teaching should be by anybody's standards, but um, I think that's, and so if you're just giving kids strategies or, or skills that will enable them to glean knowledge themselves from things they read, then you're not in that position of the sage on the stage, right? You're, you're more of the guide on the side. And I think so that's at the deep roots, but specifically with reading comprehension skills and strategies, going back at least to the 1950s, basal readers reading textbooks, they would have passages and comprehension questions. And at a certain point, those comprehension questions began to be seen as skills you could acquire. And so you could practice them on one text and then apply them, the idea was, to a text on a completely different subject. Um, and there's really not much evidence. There's no evidence that that happens. But then what happened was, so the whole language movement, 70s, 80s, really rejected those basal readers, including the part that had to do with teaching comprehension skills. And the idea was, we don't need to teach comprehension skills, and we don't need to teach phonics either. If we just surround kids with good children's literature, they'll figure out everything more or less on their own. And then, you know, and this is something that I had to kind of do primary research on because I could not find anybody who'd written about like how did balanced literacy, which is, you know, the sort of successor to whole language and, and it's, the, the, you know, borrowed a lot of its thinking. They came, balanced literacy came to embrace teaching skills and strategies. And like, how did that happen? And what I think happened is towards the end of the whole language era, teachers began to feel like they needed to do something to teach reading. It was, I mean, I, I came across this book called Mosaic of Thought, which was very influential. And the, the author was said, well, you know, I keep hearing from teachers, I'm not teaching reading, I'm not teaching reading. I'm not. And they didn't wanna go back to what, to the basal readers, they still didn't like them. So what they did was they seized upon this body, recent body of um, research by psychologists into what do skilled readers do when they read? And it turned out that probably on mostly unconsciously skilled readers were applying these metacognitive strategies where they were thinking about like, oh, what am I, am I understanding this essentially? You know, I, am I asking myself questions as I go along about, and, they thought, oh, well, maybe we can just teach these strategies, which they saw as being very different from the skills and the basal readers. Maybe we can just teach kids these strategies that expert readers use, and they will become expert readers too. And at the time, there wasn't any research indicating that you could do that, but they just went ahead and did it. And they saw those strategies as being very different from the skills. Eventually, what happened was this this distinction between skills and strategies got really blurred and balanced literacy teachers ended up teaching both and, and including a lot of the skills that the whole language had rejected in, from the basal readers, like finding the main idea, comparing and contrasting. And those things don't really have evidence behind them. But you know, the, the thing about whether you call it a skill or whether you call it a strategy, the bottom line is it's not gonna work unless you have at least a minimum level of background knowledge. Unless you're able, you have enough knowledge to understand whatever you're trying to read at at least a superficial level, neither skills nor strategies will help. I mean, even those metacognitive strategies, you, you can ask yourself questions till you're blue in the face, 
but you may not be able to answer them if you really don't understand <laughs> the text you're trying to read. Right, which also, um, <clears throat> um, for me, the most important part of literacy is getting it right for all. And I so appreciated the fact that the podcast, all three episodes always came back to the socioeconomic status. Um, that That is just the backbone of the reason why we need to close the, the knowledge gap, or I love how you call it the test score gap. I really love that. Um, but what I'm going to put on the screen um, and I'll just give a quick second for everybody to take a look at it. This is one of this is part of the Knowledge Matters campaign statement, um, and it is why we all here as educators always. And like I said, uh, again, just for me, and and jump in, Natalie, at any time, and and redirect my thinking, but. The first podcast spoke to the skill strategies and the lack of background knowledge and also the lack of equity in education. And everything that I put on the screen, by the way, is uh, quotes from the podcast. So they're there. And if there's not a name assigned to it, they are uh, Natalie's words. Um, again, going back to the, I say it, equity, I probably should have made the screen say inequity, right? I mean, that's... Mm -hmm. The, the more important function of it. Um, there were so many nuances and there were so many different ways that you kept coming back to the inequity and in the inequity of how the teaching of comprehension is, is missing the mark for this, um, you know, this population of kids. Can you speak to all the, the, the very dispar disparities that we are, you know, showing for this, these historically disadvantaged socioeconomic group of kids when it comes to comprehension? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think that this equity or inequity, whatever you want to call it, piece is crucial, central. Now, that's not to say there, there are kids from higher income families who also have knowledge gaps. And I mean, I've heard from teachers, administrators that especially in recent years as parents have everybody's been on their phones so much and there's not as much dialogue between parents and children that even kids from affluent families are coming in without a lot of good oral language, you know, with skills, knowledge, et cetera. But basically, you know, it's not even about um, income or wealth. It is really about level of parental education. And, um, and it's in our society, you know, people with less higher education generally tend to have lower incomes. But if you can look at, if you can slice and dice the data, it's not, not often done, but if you can uh, say, ask what happens if you're a poor kid, but both of your parents have PhDs, how do you do on standardized tests? You know, that would be really interesting. And so one study we do have that sheds light on that question is a study that was done by the Brookings Institution about 10 years ago, where they looked at kindergarten readiness. Mm -hmm. And they found, not surprisingly, that kids from higher income families were far more likely to be ready for kindergarten than kids from lower income families. But they then they looked at different categories within those classifications. And they found there was just one category in which kids from lower income families were more likely to be ready for kindergarten than kids from higher income families. And that was if their mother had a BA or above. Mm -hmm. So it's, you know, really that income thing is a proxy to a large extent for level of parental education. And so, but so what, what can parents with more education do for their kids? Well, they may not do this deliberately, but they, first of all, they can read books to them and we all know how important that is, but they also beyond that, what's really crucial is having dialogue dialogues with children that introduce them to some more sophisticated vocabulary and knowledge, right? And if you've got more education, you're in a much better position to do that. Um, and of course, you know, in our society, if you've got more education, you're probably also in a better position to do things like take your kids on trips to Europe or whatever, um, which also increases their knowledge. But so schools are not going to be able to make up for all of those advantages, but what they can do 
you know, fairly easily compared to solving all the problems of poverty is give all kids access to the same kind of academic knowledge and vocabulary that kids from more highly educated families are taking in, you know, sort of almost from birth as just part of their environment. So there is a lot more that schools can be doing to level that playing field than they're currently doing. Yeah, I was listening to, um, I was listening to your book on Audible um, I, I, for the second time. <laughs> oh, sorry, this is my, my second go around. And you were talking about um, taking content out and how it's all, you know, now just like so much folk, you know, in order to get reading scores better, they took everything else out. So let's teach reading and teach reading and teach reading and let's take content out. And it was funny, it occurred to me, like not only has content been taken out, but like probably K2, almost every classroom in K2. And, and I appreciate genuinely the need for, you know, the social emotional learning component of education, but what has been, re what has been replaced what has replaced content is like an all about me unit. And I thought, is it like in listening to you, I was like, well, like let's celebrate them and let's get to know each other. But I was listening to a podcast um, when you were on with Melissa and Lori and, and you were talking about a, a sports passage. And it was just, it was an aside that you said it. I just happened to hear it. You're like, I mean, why are we going to give them a sports passage? But then I thought, why are we giving them all about me when we could be, be giving them content and science. Yeah, yeah. Well, I have a couple of thoughts about that. Um, I mean, I think the the all about me thing goes back a long way and it's premised on the idea that young children will only be interested in and or only be able to handle uh, topics that relate to themselves and their own immediate environment. And that, you know, I think most parents many parents will know that that really doesn't make sense. What about dinosaurs? I mean, my kids were fascinated by all sorts of things that, yeah. that you're not, dinosaurs are not part of their immediate environment to be sure. Um, and there's really no evidence for that. And, and kids can get very interested in things like history if they're presented engagingly. Um, but uh, the other thing that springs to mind is, so yes, you know, the idea is we want to get those reading test scores up. The thing we need to do is spend more time on reading and the reading tests purport to just be measuring comprehension skills, right? So if, especially if test scores are low, then the theory is, well, you spend more time on those skills, we're going to boost reading scores. Seems to make sense, but there is an interesting study. So this was a study that looked at a body of data that had been collected by the federal government on um, 7,000 elementary school students in the United States. And one of the things they asked questions about, well, how they asked the schools, well, how much time do you spend on each of these subjects? You know, ELA, math, science, social studies, and the arts. And it turns out, according to this data, the reported average of time on ELA or reading is two hours a day. Math, it's about 80 minutes. In science and social studies, supposedly it's about 30 minutes each, which I can tell you from talking to many teachers and being in many schools, that is way optimistic about how much time yeah. is spent in science yeah. and social studies every day. And often, you know, there'll be a half an hour a day in the schedule at the end of the day, but it often gets used for reading and math. But so anyway, these researchers decided to look at this data and they asked, what happens if kids get an extra half an hour a day of social studies? The, over the average. And they found that by fifth grade, that was correlated with higher reading test scores. They also looked at what happens if kids get an extra half an hour a day of reading or ELA. And they found that was not correlated with higher reading test scores. And now the study cannot tell us why, but one possibility is that kids were acquiring knowledge and vocabulary from extra social studies that was enabling them to understand the passages on reading tests and therefore demonstrate their skills. And that conclusion is bolstered by the fact that it was the kids from the lowest income families, parents presumably with the least education, who got the biggest boost from extra social studies. And the kids from the wealthiest families 
did got no boost from extra social studies, which doesn't mean they don't need it, but you know, they, they'd be interested in it, but um, they probably already had that vocabulary, right? So in our well-intentioned effort to boost reading scores by spending more time on reading, we're really shooting ourselves in the foot. Well, you know, it's, again, the book was transformational for me as was um, the writing revolution. And I, everything in education sort of comes back and, and you know, when you've been around a long time, uh, you know, me, <laughs> you know, I'm going back to what I used to do. And I used to do a lot of, you know, the thematic learning. Mm. And after reading the writing revolution, I did. I'm, I'm back and I'm all in and I'm, I'm 100%, I get it. And so I spent, you know, I spent the year doing bats and penguins and uh, mm. we hatched ducks. And my, and I teach, for, sorry, I, I didn't introduce myself. I teach first grade in Connecticut. I've been teaching first grade for almost 20 years, but my kids made up a game of echolation during recess. Mm -hmm. And they, you know, there's nothing that they can't do, uh, but we have to give it to them. And if we don't give it to them, they'll never do it. And had I not spent, you know, three weeks on bats, that never would have happened. If I spent three weeks on all about me, they would have stayed in there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, I think there's a lot of emphasis in the American education system on choice, on giving kids choice of what, what, what do you want to read about? Like you, you can choose what you want to learn about. There's, there's something to that, but you cannot choose to learn about a topic that you don't know even exists. And what I've heard over and over again from teachers like you, is that when you introduce kids to a new topic in an engaging way, they want to learn more about it. They choose to learn more about bats or whatever, um, right. or the war of 1812. You know, there are all sorts of things they want to learn more about once a teacher has introduced them to the possibility. You know, the other thing with, um, <clears throat> and, and, you know, of course, I believe in choice too, you know, um, but one of the reasons why I make a lot of choices for them is because I have a vision and I know exactly where I'm leading them. And something that I have been reminding administrators, you know, in my career is, again, teaching first grade, they've only been upright for a certain number of years, like literally upright. So that's why I you know, they think they have a lot more choice than they actually do. That's how I parent it as well. You know, you thought you made that choice. I made the choice for you. I just framed it in a very intelligent way for you. But it's the same thing in education. You know, I chose bats because I knew that bats would, you know, lead to other things. But they're also, you know, they're the first graders and I'm the teacher. Um, I just didn't mean to go on my own little rant there, but there I go. Uh, so episode two. My, oh, sorry about that. I opened my email shortly before um, eight o'clock tonight. And it was very ironic that you had sent the email um, about the WUGS and to talk about it a little more. When I read that study, I it, it really brought me to tears because I, I'm pretty sure I probably said out loud, well, there you have it. Now we know there is no difference. There is no difference yeah. in these population of kids. So I'm beyond grateful for that study. Would you talk about that more and what exactly the results tell us? Yeah, I mean, it is a great study that I think people should know more about, which is one reason I, I wrote the, um, the post about it. Uh, so I, people may have heard of the baseball study, which you know shows like if you have knowledge of a topic, you're going to be more likely to understand a text on that topic. I mean, this is a, that was a study with seventh and eighth graders, and the kids who were baseball experts, but supposedly according to a standardized test, poor readers, they did really well when they were reading about baseball, and the fact they did better than the good readers who didn't know much about baseball. So that study gets talked about a lot. This WUG study, as, it, as I refer to it, as it's sometimes called, goes farther than that because it, first of all, connects the knowledge to socioeconomic status. And secondly, 
it shows what happens when you take away the advantage of that knowledge. And if you can equalize background knowledge, what happens? So th this study was done with four-year-olds and um, the researchers, it was really a three-part study. The first part was just, oh, so, and, and the four-year-olds came from, some of them came from low socioeconomic status families and some came from middle socioeconomic status families. And socioeconomic status is, you know, based on combination of income, education, type of job, that kind of thing. So they determined in the first part of the study that the kids who from, were from a higher socioeconomic status knew more about the topic of birds. And then they read all of the kids' story essentially about birds. I mean, they were they used extinct bird species, but they described bird behaviors like the Amoa bill builds a nest and the moa is looking for his hat in the nest. And they found when they tested comprehension the, of those story, that storybook, that the kids from the higher SES families, the ones who had more background knowledge about birds did better. They were better at making inferences, et cetera. Then the third part of the study, they equalized background knowledge for all of these kids. And how did they do that? Very, really cleverly, they, they invented animals called wugs. And they had the same kind of storybook, but this time all of the animals, they weren't birds, they were wugs. And they were doing slightly different things. And this time, after they read the story to, book to the kids, they tested the knowledge, of the, the comprehension of all the kids, including their ability to make inferences, et cetera. And this time with wugs, there was no difference between the higher SES kids and the lower SES kids. They were all equally able to make inferences, et cetera. So I do think that really sheds a lot of light on what's going on with comprehension. Right. And it's our job to provide the background knowledge. That's right. And, you know, I mean, it's uh, providing background knowledge is a long-term, gradual, cumulative process that ideally should start in kindergarten. You know, I mean, the, the WUG study is great. It's like this little discrete piece of knowledge. You can take it away and whatever, but knowledge is way more complex than that. Comprehension is more complex than that. And the longer we wait to start building knowledge for all kids, the greater the gap is between kids who've picked up knowledge of birds and all sorts of things at home and the kids who aren't as able to do that. So that's why it's so important to start early. You know, it's funny when I, when I started my own science of reading journey, um, so much was so obvious to me when it came to decoding, like it was so clear to me that you can't put a post-it note on a word. Like I, that was never in question for me. Um, so that, that was an easy sell for me. I needed no new learning on that. But oddly enough, the very first thing I ever listened to was Susan Lambert's very first podcast with you. <laughs> yeah. Talking about, well, if you want to teach them writing, have them write through content. And I, I can still see myself. I was, I was walking through town and I stopped dead in my tracks and I thought, right. And the best part of it is there's no downside. Like, what's the downside to teaching content? Yeah. It's, it's so I, authentic. Yeah. I mean, and the, the, you know, it's hard to read about a topic you don't have much background knowledge on, but it's really, really hard. It's not impossible to write about a topic you really don't know much about. So um, yeah. And they've only been upright for a handful of years. So there's not a lot of topics that they are expert in. Right. Um, I, yeah. I dipped over to the chat very, very briefly, as I, I told you before, I hate to take my eyes off of you, but there was just a quick little conversation that I caught. And I know that this is very real for teachers. There's a lot of teacher guilt out there um, that we didn't, you know, that we haven't closed the gap and that we haven't done it the, the way that we now know to do. Um, would you care to address that at all? The, just oh, yeah. Yeah, and I mean, I've had, I've had teachers cry in front of me. It's just, um, I understand those feelings of guilt, but, I mean, it is nobody's fault. This is a systemic problem. I mean, same with as with phonics, you know, as with all of this stuff relating to 
teaching and, te and teaching reading in particular, uh, you know, teachers have been doing the best they could with the training and materials they have had. And, they, but I, I understand though, that even, you know, even if I say, or somebody says, look, it's not your fault, it's still painful to hear. If, you, if you've been teaching in a certain way for years in the good faith belief that you've been helping kids and somebody comes along and says, eh, actually, you know, I mean, that's, that's very painful, very difficult to take in. And, and I think all of us as human beings, it's just natural to raise defenses against taking in that kind of painful message. Um, and what continues to, to amaze me is how many teachers, educators are nevertheless so willing to not only accept, but even embrace this message and the need for change and change is hard, you know? So to me, I, I am in awe of those educators. And, um, to me, it speaks to how deeply they care about their students, that they're willing to say yes what I was, something was missing from what I was doing and I'm gonna change. Well, and it speaks to why Donna Heitmanick start. you know, that's her page. That's the name of it. Yeah. She yeah. had been taught in college. Donna, you, do you wanna to speak to this? Yeah, Natalie, do you have any thoughts about how a reform of this magnitude can happen in the States or around the world really uh, on both, parts of the rope that we are still, you know, using antiquated approaches. I mean, it's, it's really difficult to get this whole message out there. It, it is. And um, I mean, I don't think it's possible for change to happen overnight because it took us a long time to get into this mess. It's going to take a while to really get out. Um, but I do think it can't just be imposed from above. Right. And it also can't just bubble up from below. It has to happen. Both of those things has to have to happen at the same time, because if it's just imposed, you know, I mean, teachers have been told for God knows how long. I mean, my mother was a teacher, you know, do some, do this other thing. And they're not told why. And it's just, we're doing something different now. Um, and that doesn't work because teachers do need to understand why you know that change is hard so if you don't know why it's important you may not do it um so teachers have to be brought along but at the same at the same time if if teachers want to change what's going on without support from administrators and policymakers that's also very difficult because individual teachers really don't have the power to control what happens throughout the education system. And, and as I mentioned, knowledge building is this gradual cumulative process that extends across grade levels um, and teachers don't have control over other grade levels. So I, I, but I think, you know, so it can't just be imposed from above. It can't just be initiated from below. And um, I think the best way for this to spread is ideally sort of organically, because I think teachers trust each other more than they're, going to trust somebody, you know, in some office somewhere telling them you should do this other thing now. So I think that there's a great power in sort of networks of teachers talking to each other, some of whom are trying these new things and telling other teachers about it. Right. Yeah, I see what you're saying, though, about top down, bottom up. Um, I personally would like to see this change at our higher ed level. And um, because that's really the start, you know, of, of where it's all happening and, um, you know, getting, getting our schools of ed to get our, get professors to be changing their approaches and their teaching. And, um, and, you, and, you know, I don't even know if that needs to be done legislatively or, um, you know, a task force <laughs> in some yeah. way. You know, I mean, I don't know if you know of anything that's being discussed at that level. You know, I'm certainly not privy to that, but, you know, you may have heard some things. Yeah, I mean, I, it would be a tremendous help if um, the teacher training, teacher prep programs were to embrace all of the science related to reading. Right. But I, and, and maybe someday that'll happen, but I do think that that's sort of the toughest nut to crack. Um, that 
it, it's it's you know really hard for legislators or even administrators of of schools of education to control what actually goes on in the classroom and right. it's you know I, I think I think there is I, I've seen some evidence that as you know teacher professors of education become younger and have been exposed to all of these science of reading stuff that that things that they're they're more receptive to new ideas but um I think we, we need to keep trying to change that, but I don't think we can wait for that to change. I think we need to simultaneously be, be, be um, giving practicing teachers access to curricula uh, and, and explanations that can guide them to classroom practice that doesn't necessarily fit with what they've learned during their training is gonna work. Because what they learned during their training is probably you know got some problems. True. We did start a group uh, SOR for um, pre-service teachers, okay. and it's it's small, a couple hundred people. But um, again, you know, it's that exposure for pre-service teachers to, to steer them down the right path. Uh, we're hoping that we can get more members. Um, well, you know. uh, Donna, he also started a, a Reddit page because moms have ruined Facebook for the younger generation. Right. He thinks it might just be the uh, the venue, not the not the message. I had to look up what Reddit was. So just to just to clue you in, you know, <laughs> this is how bad my life is. It's a thing, apparently. It's a thing for the kids. Oh my gosh. I asked my husband, what does that mean? He goes, I don't know. <laughs> Natalie, I'm curious. You have been ringing this bell for many, many years. Do you, what's your take on... Uh, are you more hopeful now? Like, do you feel like we are starting to move in the right direction? Do we still have a long way to go? What's your take on our journey thus far? Is that to me? Oh, oh. Is, yeah. Who, who you are you are? Yeah. What, what's my, what's my take on this? this? Um, well, certainly the momentum is there. Um, but you know, it's really hard because we can't see clearly because we're we're in the pot. <laughs> you know, we can't see what's going on outside the world. I mean, you think that everyone is um, is clued into science of reading? No, they're not. So it's it's a slow process. Um, but I will say, just from my own personal experience. Um, we were working on legislation in Wisconsin for, I'm not kidding you, maybe 15 plus years. And in the last week, we did have legislation that was um, signed. And we are so excited because it does include higher ed needing to take training, science of reading training. So, um, you know, big changes. The bill was 38 pages long. It's, it's a massive overhaul. Um, but again, you know, change is hard. It can be legislative, but that doesn't mean it's going to um, dribble down to, you know, the classroom level. That takes time. And same question for you, Natalie. What's your take on the, the progress thus far? Well, there's certainly been, I mean, my book came out almost four years ago, and there's certainly been a lot of change since then, and a lot of it is heartening. But I would just say, we have to be careful with um, def the way we define the science of reading. I mean, the um, I saw a reference in the chat to the NCTQ, the National Council on Teacher Quality, and their ratings of teacher prep programs, which are, you know, I mean, there's been some improvement, uh, still not great, but when they look at, at the comprehension aspect of reading, when they're looking at those teacher prep programs, all they're looking for is essentially teaching about skills and strategies. Uh, they're not even looking for anything relating to the need to build kids' knowledge. And so, you know, I think we have a, a very long way to go there. I think we've made more progress. It's not enough yet, but we've made definitely made more progress on the phonics slash foundational skills side of things than we have on the comprehension side of things. And one thing that worries me is that some people may be getting the idea that if we just 
do a better job with phonics, that that's all we need to do. And, and the, that kids will become fully literate. And that's unfortunately for most kids, not the case. If we don't also simultaneously build their knowledge and vocabulary and their familiarity with the complex syntax, sentence structure of written language, you're gonna find that when kids get to like sixth, seventh, eighth grade and beyond, they may be able to decode the text they're expected to read, but they may well not be able to understand it. You know, just in, in my like small world, you know, in my school, but in the larger world, in the community of science of reading, and particularly on edu Twitter, um, decoding was not a hard sell. Like everybody was like, sure, fine. You know, systemic direct instruction, done. Uh, there's been like no pushback on that, but it's the comprehension piece that's like a, a much slower role. And mm -hmm. why do you think that is? Well, I think it's less familiar. Um, it hasn't been, you know, we've been talking about phonics at least since 1955 when uh, Rudolf Flesch came out with Why Johnny Can't Read. And the, the, that, that really overlooked the comprehension part of things. And it just hasn't been addressed. And it is a lot more complicated. I think also there, there is, there are studies showing that if you teach comp at least certain kinds of comprehension strategies, that can boost standardized test scores. And I think people seize on that. And that's what the National Reading Panel seized on. Uh, but that's not all you need to do. And it's not like you choose between building knowledge and teaching skills and strategies. That, that That's a false dichotomy. If you're gonna build knowledge, you are gonna be incorporating skills and strategies. It's just a question of what gets put in the foreground. So if you are trying to teach the skill of determining author's purpose, and you are choosing texts that you think will help you teach that skill, that's probably not gonna work. But if you're teaching about a topic or using a text where it makes sense to ask, what do you think the author's purpose was here? That's perfectly legitimate. It's a question of like, are you, you know, what are you trying to teach, the skill or the content? And what the only thing that works is to teach the content and bring in whatever skills or strategies are appropriate for helping kids to really think about that content. And I, I think, so I think that to, science in this area can actually lead to some confusion because people will look, could look at the National Reading Panel report and say, look, oh, there's scientific evidence for teaching reading comprehension skills and strategies. But I would make a, a few points about that. One is most of the skills and strategies we spend time on in classrooms, the National Reading Panel report did not find evidence for those. Right. And the ones they did find evidence for, most of those studies lasted six weeks. And, and some scientists have looked at that data and said, well, there's really no benefit after about two weeks. And we try to teach these things year after year. Um, and there's no evidence to support that. You know, it's interesting to me that um, mm -hmm. you talked about, um, you know, there is a place for skill, but they have to have the background knowledge in order for the skill to the Velcro, right? Um, yeah. There was a graphic that was shared so often on, I saw it in several places of social media that it was that, you know, you can still teach the skill, but then in like smaller print, it said, as long as the background knowledge is there. And I was like, that's so not what the biggest point is. <laughs> like the biggest point is you can still teach the skill. For me, the biggest point is like, you need to provide the, the background knowledge and the content. And then when they have it, and it's an appropriate skill, talk about it. But it was sort of like, wherever that graphic came from, when I read it, I was like, so many teachers went, phew, I can still teach skills, but that's not at all what you're saying. Yeah, no, and I mean, it's not that teachers are not unaware of the importance of background knowledge because activating prior knowledge is one of the skills and strategies, right? But if kids don't have relevant prior knowledge to activate, right. that won't work. And I mean, I also, you know, I think teachers also sometimes are aware that, um, oh, my kids aren't gonna know these five or six terms in this text that they're supposed to read. And so they will define those terms for kids before they read it. And that can get those kids through that particular text. But unless kids have a deeper, richer context for those terms, and unless they hear those terms repeatedly, 
right. in, in slightly different contexts. Those those vocabulary words are not going to stick in long-term memory. So the next time they see a text using those words, they may well not remember what they mean. So it's got to be a much more knowledge focused process. Right, right. Um, Natalie, I'm going to leave this up to you. As I said in the email today, all decisions are yours. <laughs> um, I We can jump into episode three or we can jump into some questions from the chat. Oh, oh well, I would, I would love to hear some questions from the chat, um, you know, if, if right. people have. Okay. Donna, do you have some for us or do you want me to jump in? Um, I haven't been looking, but I think, um, I, can look. I mean, I've been looking, but I didn't. All right. Here's one in kinder and first, should knowledge be built in conjunction with an explicit phonics instruction? Yeah. Well, I mean, I would say in conjunction with, I obviously you got to be doing both of those things simultaneously. Um, I mean, not right. at the same time, but you know, in the course of the school day. But the thing is, I think we've been ho expecting kids to basically acquire knowledge th through texts that they can decode themselves. And it's important to realize that that's not going to be enough. They should definitely be, as soon as I say, literacy it's gonna proceed along two separate paths that will ultimately converge. So one path is they're working on those foundational skills, they're reading decodable texts, they're practicing their fluency, et cetera. That's hugely important, but that's not the way they're gonna acquire new knowledge and vocabulary probably in the first instance and familiarity with the complex syntax of written language. That's gonna come other path where their knowledge is built through read aloud, listening to complex text being read aloud by the teacher and talking about the content of that text and using the vocabulary they've just heard. And that will enable them to store that information, that vocabulary in long-term memory. And then eventually when their decoding skills, their foundational skills patch up to where their knowledge and vocabulary is in long-term memory, it's gonna enable them to read and write at a higher level. Mm -hmm. Here's a question from Lauren Brown. I teach middle school history, and when it comes to history, social studies, there is considerable pushback against knowledge because it's assumed that that means just teaching dates and facts and memorizing stuff, which is not what I do. But I do find it hard sometimes to delve deeper and get my students to think critically when they don't know the basic facts. That is, when talking about the start of World War II, a student asked uh, if Germany was part of Russia. Any thoughts on that? Oh boy, yes, lots of thoughts. I mean, of course, just memorizing dates and facts is not the end goal here, but it, to a large extent, it's, it's where learning has to begin. If you don't have that kind of information stored in long-term memory, it's gonna be hard for you to engage in higher order thinking about that topic. So I think, you know, memorization has become this taboo word. We don't, God forbid, we don't want kids memorizing anything. But, you know, it's just another word for storing things in long-term memory. And um, it doesn't have to be boring. It can be done in a way that's quite engaging. Uh, the more information about a topic, I won't say facts, but the more information about a topic that you have in long-term memory, the better able you are to think critically about it, to, to reason about it, to do all those things that we want kids to do. And we've really, I think the entire American education system has devalued um, retaining information in long-term memory. It, it is essential. And it's, I, th I, you know, and, and they, I think they've devalued history for this reason that the questioner mentioned, um, you know, that it is perceived as just being about memorizing a bunch of dates and places. And I'd like to put in a plug here actually for a framework for teaching history, social studies, that's called the four question method, which I think is brilliant. And I think can really, um, it, it, it incorporates the idea of getting kids to understand like what happened. That's the first question in the four questions is like, what happened? And that's essential because I think a lot of times we may assume kids under they they know like you know what the American who was fighting who in the American Revolution, but they don't actually. 
And then the second question is, what were they thinking? And that's really crucial too. What were the historical actors thinking about what they were doing? How did they see their roles? The third question is why in this particular place at this particular time, which is a complicated one. And the fourth question is, what do we think about that? Which is also important, but you can't really answer that question intelligently unless you understand what actually happened and what were the historical actors, what did they think they were doing? Hmm. So there's a couple of questions in here about curriculum, but I feel like the sun has set behind all of us. <laughs> so maybe we table the curriculum questions because that's the episode that I did not get to. So would you be comfortable um, closing the bar here? And then we can um, you know, figure out a way to uh, continue the conversation another time, or do you want to keep going? Again, I defer to you on all things. Oh, well, I mean, I, I don't know. I don't know how, how much stamina people have, but um, I, I, I'm happy to, you know, I'm happy to come back, continue this discussion, um, get into the later episodes, which um, have a lot of terrific thought provoking stuff in them, especially, I would say the, you know, what, what I think, what I hope will be really meaningful to people is getting to know some of these educators, like there are three educators in episode three, three te classroom teachers that I that I interview. And you really get to know them a bit. And they come back actually in episode four, and you get to know them a little bit more. And their experience, I think, is really powerful. I think it should be powerful for, for other teachers. So, um, you know, I'd love to come back and hear people's reactions to all of that and, and their questions at some later date. All right, so this is, I'm officially putting the bar stools up on the bar. I'm <laughs> sweeping under okay. our feet as we speak. <laughs> Last call. Last call, that's right. Well, Natalie, I truly cannot thank you enough um, on so many levels, um, but particularly thank you uh, for tonight and thank you for sharing your time and your knowledge. I really appreciate it. And thanks to everybody that came to listen. Well, and yeah. I agree. Thanks. It was a total pleasure, and I enjoyed the conversation and the questions. And uh, thanks to everybody for for joining in. Perfect. All right. Good night, Thank everyone. You, Good night, everybody.